Praise the Lord. We'll rise up as we pray together. Our Father, we thank you for our Bible study. Thank you for bringing us safely here together. Thank you, Lord, for the journey mercies. And thank you for all the locations where your people are gathered. Lord, we pray you bless everyone here and over there today. In Jesus' name, we're asking, Lord, that you breathe upon this word. Shine upon this word. Give us understanding in your word in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, we'll not just be hearers of the word only. We'll be doers of the word in Jesus' name. The grace and the strength and the power and the desire, the passion, the love to get the work done and to obey your word. You grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. Make us, Lord, people that have ears to hear. And what we hear will be of benefit to every one of us. We thank you, Father, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You can see now we're looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. There are two verses we're looking at today. Verses 11 and 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 from verse 11. Here is Paul the Apostle writing to the church. Already you know something about this church. It's a, what we call a model church. A church, converted church, a saved church, a sanctified church, a church that is steadfast, a church that is looking for the second coming of the Lord, a church that the apostle Paul had planted with Timothy and Silas, and they had shown the fruit of salvation and the fruit of righteousness. It was so good that Paul, the apostle, rejoiced over them. In fact, he said, you are the joy and the rejoicing of our heart. Not only that, he had written the first epistle to them, in which place he commended their effort. He spoke about their love, about their faith, and about their hope in the Lord. And then he also spoke about their spreading the gospel, going everywhere, and teaching other people, leading other people that they ought to know the Lord. And then he understood that they had been suffering persecution. But in their persecution, they have been very steadfast in the Lord. All the lies and the deception of the enemies did not sway them or swap them. They were focused as people of God, as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because, he had, because of that, he had sent Timothy to them. They looked at the church and when they saw the church, Timothy came back and he said, that church is doing great. They are steadfast in the word of the Lord. They are steadfast in prayer and in their persecution, they were following the Lord steadfastly. And then he wrote to them. As he wrote to them the first epistle, it was so much encouraging that he now wrote the second epistle. In the second epistle, he noted that their faith was growing. Their love, their charity towards God and towards one another was also growing. You look at verse 3, chapter 1, verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet or suitable or right, because that your faith grows exceedingly, and that the charity of every one of you toward each other abounds. They had love and they also had faith. But they were suffering persecution as well. You might wonder how is it that people who are saved and those who are righteous and those who are following after the Lord and those who love one another, love everybody, they even love their enemies. How is it that they will suffer persecution? Because Jesus Christ said, they did that to me. I'm loving. They persecuted me. I came to die for them, yet they hated me and they've done that to me. They're going to do that to you as well. That's what you find in verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you. We rejoice in you. We're proud of you. In the churches of God, for your patience and faith, in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye suffered, that ye endure. He said, we're proud of you. We glory in you everywhere. We're telling all the other churches you can be like this. In the grace of God can multiply and if the goodness of God can be very evident in the church in Thessalonica, you too, you can be like that, but he had to comfort them, to tell them that whatever they were going through will soon come to an end. That's why he said in verse 7, to you who are troubled, rest with us. Do not allow any panic or fear of man or fear of the persecutors as you have suffered. We are suffering too and we are resting the Lord because he gives us rest. That's why he said, for you are troubled. Those who are persecuted, those who are afflicted, rest with us. He said, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, he 
will punish those people with everlasting ruin, everlasting destruction, everlasting separation from the Lord. That's why now he called him, he said, well, I'm even praying for you. He had prayed for them in the first episode. And now he's praying for them again in the second epistle. Look at the first epistle, chapter 1. First epistle to Paul the Apostle to the Thessalonians, chapter 1. I'm looking at verse, I'm looking at verse 2. He says, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. We've been praying for them. Not only that, look at chapter 3. Chapter 3, pay for them as well. He said in verse 9, chapter 3, for what thanks can we render to God again for for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. It says, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and that we might be able to perfect that which concerns your faith. So he's been praying for them, praying over and over and over again. But now he comes to tell us the details of the prayer, the request of the prayer that brings me now to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 11 and 12. And this prayer is very important because it is spirit inspired. It is spirit guided. It is spirit controlled. And many believers ought to learn from the prayers of the Bible. There are many people that pray but when you look at the prayer there's no substance. There's no words. There's no value. But when you come back to the Bible and you look at the New Testament in particular and you see the prayers that the apostles prayed the prayers that Jesus Christ prayed and the prayers that the prophets of old that they prayed for the people of God, the nation of Israel. Then you begin to understand how we ought to transform and change and renew our prayers so that our prayers will look like the prayers in the Bible. As you look at these people that Paul the Apostle was praying for, they were growing believers in a model church. That church of the Thessalonians, those prayers were guided and inspired by the Holy Ghost and here we can see the request of the prayer that he prayed for the church and the reason for such prayer requests as well. Not only the prayer, but the reason, the purpose of that prayer in comparison the, the prayers of almost all the believers today, anywhere and everywhere, those prayers are shallow. The prayers are many times misdirected and the prayers many times, they are short-sighted. Very often Christians demonstrate selfishness in their prayers. Don't only really demonstrate selfishness but shallowness in their prayers. As you look at all the prayers that many people are praying, analyze it. What are they praying for? They are praying for some little, little things, the needs of the body, some personal problems they want the Lord to solve for them, some personal benefits of comforts that they want to have. Instead of praying for something that will benefit their never dying eternal souls. They are praying for food and for house, for husband, for wife. They are praying for children, for a car, for a job. They are praying for promotion. They are praying for money. All these things, though they are part of life, they are very low. On Paul's agenda of priority least in prayer. In fact, our Lord Jesus Christ taught us, he said, we should not take thought of all those things. Those are the things that the Gentiles are seeking. And when you pray for just that alone, you make yourself synonymous or equal to the Gentiles. But he said, we should pray for the kingdom of God and pursue the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What do you pray for? Think about your prayer. Analyze your prayer. Examine your prayer. And put your prayer on the table. Then put them piece by piece, one by one. What are the things that occupy your mind when you pray? When you're praying for yourself, you're praying for your children, you're praying for your wife, you're praying for your husband, you're praying for members of the church. What are the details and the requests of that prayer? Do you desire that what do you desire for your church? For the church, local church where you are, and for the church at large, do you have the right priority and proper value in prayer? What's your value system? This prayer of Paul the Apostle calls us to a necessary transformation in our desires and prayer requests. We must be wise to belittle what things will ultimately be of little value and then concentrate and focus our prayers and pursuits on what is precious and eternally priceless. Having said that, I'm going to read to you verses 11 and 12. It says, Wherefore also we pray always for you. What an example for ministers, for pastors, for preachers, for overseers, praying always. 
for the people we disciple. Praying always for the people that are converted through us. Praying always for the people in our house fellowships. Praying always for the people who look up to us for their steadfastness and stability in the faith. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God will count you worthy. What a prayer. What a prayer. It's not for little, little things of this world that our God will count you worthy. Worthy of what? Worthy of the calling that he has given you. has called us to salvation. Pray that God will count you worthy of that calling. He has called us to sanctification. We pray that God will count you worthy of that call to sanctification. He's called us to service and he's praying that God will count the people worthy of their service. He has called them to, he has called us so that we can get through and make the rapture so that we can get to the kingdom, worthy of the kingdom. And then he says, and fulfill all his good pleasure of his goodness. He's saying, you know what I'm praying for? That God wants to be pleased with your life. He wants to be pleased with your language. He wants to be pleased with every area of your character. And he says, I am praying that God will count you worthy. I'm praying that God will make you to be able to do at the power, the grace and the strength and the desire, the passion and the zeal to be able to fulfill all his good pleasure. And then he says, I'm praying that the work of faith will power, will be manifested in you. He says, I'm praying that you'll not be a weakling. You'll not be a person with weak knees and weak backbone. No conviction. No strength. No courage. To be able to face life. It says I don't want you to remain weak. I'm praying that the work of faith will power will so work in your life that in all your persecutions your backbone will be very strong. Your knees will be very strong and your feet will be very strong and you'll be able to follow the Lord boldly and without any fear. Then it says that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. It said what I'm praying for is that anywhere you find yourself in the classroom, in the school, in the hospital where you are working, in the uh, school where you are working, in the company where you are working, in your community where you are living. It says, I'm praying that every detail of your life will bring glory unto the Lord Jesus Christ and it will take knowledge of you that you are born again, that you are a child of God, that Jesus Christ has made the change and the transformation in your life. And then it says, and ye in him according to the grace of our God uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're looking at today. We're dividing the study to three parts. Number one, we have the unfolding purpose of fulfilling his pleasure. Uh, you need to understand that when you become a Christian, the reason why you're even created at all is so that you fulfill the pleasure of the Lord. Many people take their lives to their hands. They say, this is what I want to do. That is what I want to become. This is where I want to go. This is what I want want to establish and this is what I want to affirm every time it is I I want to I will be I will go I will say this I will say that I will establish this it says that's not the purpose of living the purpose of living is that you were created to start with to fulfill his pleasure you are redeemed and saved and converted and born again so that you can fulfill his pleasure. That's why Paul, the apostle here, tells us now of the unfolding purpose of fulfilling his pleasure. Number two is the unfailing power of faith in his promise. If you're going to be able to fulfill his pleasure, if you're going to be able to fulfill all the will of the Lord every time, everywhere, you need the power. And that power comes by faith. The unfailing power of faith in his promises. Otherwise, you'll have knowledge. You'll not have the power to carry it out. There'll be a lot of promises, but there'll be no practical action. But for your action, for your life, for your character to match the knowledge of the word of God that you know, you need that power and it comes by faith. The unfailing power of faith in his promises. Number three is the unforgettable praise and faithfulness of his people. The people of God that we have over here in the church of the Thessalonians that they actually, their lives were praised to God. The work of their hand was a praise to the Lord. Everything they did, everywhere they went, it was a praise unto the Lord. I pray that what the Lord did for the church of the Thessalonians, it will do for me, it will do for you. It will do for every one of us together so that as we have this good record and clear record concerning this church and concerning these believers, this same record God will have for you and for me and for our church in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number one now, the unfolding purpose. You know, sometimes the purpose is hidden and concealed. It's not unfolded. It's not opened up. 
And we don't even know. We just know that here we are in the world. What am I to do here? Why am I here? Why am I in the church? The unfolding purpose of fulfilling his pleasure. Come back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm reading verse 11. It says, Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God will count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all his good pleasure of his goodness. I'm going to read that again. That he will fulfill the pleasure of his goodness. It will fulfill the pleasure of his goodness. But he's saying it's not just for one day. There are some people that live so good and so righteous and so holy. And they please the Lord only one day. The following day is a different story. The following week is a different story. But he says that it will help you. That you will fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness that means that all the days of your life and it is possible because there was an enoch that pleased the lord that did the good pleasure of the lord all the days of his life 300 years he just was pleasing the lord pleasing the lord pleasing the lord and jesus christ himself the very son of god who came to give us a perfect example the lord god of heaven said here is my beloved son in whom i'm well pleased and he pleased the lord every time we can please the lord too we're going to please the lord I said we're going to please the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 14. You'll see the prayer that Paul the Apostle prayed for the church of the Ephesians. He tells us, he says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named, that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might, by a spirit in the inner man to fulfill his pleasure and to do all his goodness. It means that we need the strength in the inner man. You know, there are some people that outwardly, they look, they look strong. Outwardly, they look big. Outwardly, it appears that nothing can confront them, but internally, they're very weak. They're frightened. They're fearful. And a little boy will threaten them, then they will not be able to follow their conviction. That's why Paul, the apostle, said, Whatever your stature, whether you are small or big or tall or short, a man or a woman, he said, there is something you need. Strength in the inner man, that your inner man, your spirit, your heart will be so strong, you will say, here is the way to go, and by the grace of God, whatever the temptation, whatever the trial, whatever the affliction, whatever the persecution, that is the way to go. And I'm going there, and you'll get there in Jesus' name. And Paul, the apostle said, you know, that's why I'm praying for you, efficient believers, that he will strengthen you with might by spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And the Christ who dwells in us is not a weakened Christ. It's not a kind of impotent Christ. It's not a Christ who cannot act. A Christ who cannot live. A Christ who cannot rise up in, the, in strength. He says that Christ, the risen Christ, the mighty Christ, and the, the Christ that no one can defeat, that the devil cannot defeat. He said that Christ will live in your heart by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to complain with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that she might be filled with what? Tell me, tell me. Or the fullness of God. It says, the fullness of God. Even a little bit of the grace of God will make a person's son. What if then you are filled with all the fullness of God? That means the possibility is there. And then you live a victorious life. And you live a life that is pleasing to the Lord in Jesus' name. You see, prayer is a great resource for necessary transformation. In order to please the Lord in all things. To be worthy of God's high calling. Emily calling and holy calling to live a life that is well pleasing to God and to see people of God ready and prepared for our lost return. We must pray and intercede for other people faithfully. That's why you find Paul the Apostle did two things. Number one, he preached faithfully. Number two, he prayed constantly. Number one, he preached faithfully. He made the people of God to know what's the will of God, what's the pleasure of the Lord, what will please the Lord. He gave them the knowledge. Then he said, that's not enough. I preached 
I'm going to pray for you now. And then he prayed for them that they'll be able to do the will of the Lord. And it is that that makes ministry successful. Preaching faithfully and praying constantly. He revealed the high standards of the gospel. And then he constantly saw the face of the Lord to help and to strengthen the believers to fulfill his will. He knew that the most dedicated believers could not fully obey the Lord except through divine enablement. And that enablement will not come except through prayer. That's why he prayed always for them. And we must pray for ourselves. We must pray for other believers also that God will grant us and grant them and grant the whole church sufficient help and power to obey his word and to fulfill his pleasure and to stand complete in all the revealed will of God and the perfect will of God. As he prayed for the efficient believers, see the conclusion of his prayer, verse 20, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we, are, we may ask or sin according to the power that worketh in us unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end amen he says the prayer was prayer was not just for that time he said world without end and throughout all the ages which means this part of the ages he says throughout all the ages that the same prayer he prayed for them is praying that prayer for us and in fact jesus christ is also praying for us that's why we know we're going to be victorious that's why we know no temptation will bring us down in jesus name that's why we know no persecution or persecutor no detractor or any opposer will be able to oppose us successfully that heaven we're going to get there. And then every day of our lives, trial, temptation, testing, whatever comes, and we're following after the Lord. And when the devil says there is no way, or we say there is a way because Jesus Christ is the way, the way to victory and the way to success. And the way to real power that nothing will be able to stop our onward journey in Jesus' name. As he prayed for those sufficiency, he prayed for the Colossians, he prayed for the Philippians. Look at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, and then you see from verse 9, it says, And this I pray. Can you think about uh, this person here? He didn't have only one congregation. He had congregation in Philippa, he prayed for them. Phil congregation in Ephesus, he prayed for them. Congregation in Corinth, he prayed for them. Congregation in Tesnaka, he prayed for them. He prayed for all the congregations that he had. And there are some people that cannot even pray for one congregation. Or Paul the Apostle, all the congregation that he ministered to, he wrote to them, he challenged them, he encouraged them, he lifted them up, and then he exhorted them. He even commanded them. And those who there to be kind of a discipline, he disciplined them too. And then he prayed for every one of them. I pray that that same faithfulness that God has given Paul the Apostle, he'll give that faithfulness to all our pastors. It says in verse 9, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more, in knowledge and in all judgment, that she may approve the things that are excellent. It says that many things will come to you, and some of them will not be excellent. Some of them will not be right. Some of them will be kind of sinful. And it says God will give you the wisdom that will approve the things that are right, the things that are excellent, that it's not everything every brother says that you just take like that. It's not everything every sister says that you just take like that. You examine everything. You have the wisdom of God. Otherwise, you'll not be able to please God because there are some people that do not have the mind of Christ. They do not have the way of Christ. And if they do not have the mind of Christ and the way of Christ, and it just presents something to you, and you don't have the wisdom, and the insight to know this is right and that is wrong. Then you just follow people sheepishly. But it says God will give you the wisdom that you'll be able to approve the things that are excellent, that she may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and the praise of God. I pray that God will do that for you and for me. Look at chapter 2, verse 12. Chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, 
not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Can I stop there for a moment? Many years ago, all the deeper life in our capital city, Lagos, here, we were together. That is, everybody at Bagada. Everybody came to that Monday Bible study. Everybody came to that Thursday meeting. Everybody came on Sunday. We we're all together every Sunday, every Monday, every Thursday. And that time, we saw each other. And everybody will toe the line. We know that this is what you do. That is what you do. But in the 90s, as we were expanding and growing, we saw that Bagada could not you know, take us anymore. But thank God, Bagada is coming up now. Yeah. And when that place finishes, I'm telling you, we'll come together again. Yeah. Are you getting ready for that time? I said, are you getting ready for that time? It's coming. I said, it's coming. And then when it comes, I will see where you will be at that time. Where will you be? Right inside your local district over there. No, we'll be together. Now, the point is, in the 90s, we decentralized. And then, because the GS, the pastor, is not always here, always here, always here, there's some people that take laws into their hands. They just do whatever. They, they, no standard for them. But thank God, the standard of God standeth sure. And everyone that names the name of Christ will depart from, tell me, iniquity. Here it says, Paul the apostle was so happy for the believers in Philippi. As he was happy and well pleased with the believers in Thessalonica, he was pleased and happy for the believers in Philippi. He said, even in my absence, much more in my absence, you obey the word of the Lord. Maybe that could be said about some of us, about you in particular. In your office when your pastor is not there. In your school when your pastor is not there. In your house when your pastor is not there. Now to say, this is what I've learned concerning the word of righteousness. This is what I know concerning how to be upright. This is what I know concerning the importance and necessity of obedience to the word of God. And whether the pastor is here or not, whether the GS is here or not, I know that Christ is here. And I know that the Holy Ghost is here. I'm going to follow the standard of the word of God until the very end. I pray God will keep on helping you in Jesus' name. But you know, those who are not really born again, they are just church goers. They are just church members. They are, I'm, I'm deeper life. I'm deeper life. When we are there, they do right. When we are there, then they sit up. When we are there, they say, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. When we turn our back and then we go to another place to have ministry and then they look around pastor is not here. They do whatever they want to. Those ones are not Christians. Those ones are main pleasers. Those ones are not going to heaven. I pray that you will not be among them. But the people that really love the Lord and they are serving the Lord and they say, I know that this is the way and this is the word and this is how to live and whether anybody is there or not, I'm going to live like that. Those are the real believers. I pray God will count you worthy. Look at verse 12. Wherefore my beloved, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not only sometimes, not sometimes, not sometimes, always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Walk out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He said, don't, don't uh, toy with your salvation. The salvation you have, don't make it like a toy. Don't make it like a ball that you throw up and throw down. Keep it. Hold on to it and walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. Then he says, for it is God which walketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and without disputing, that she may be, that may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. We will not labor in vain over you in Jesus' name. And you know, when people get saved and remain saved, that means we are not laboring in vain. When people get sanctified and they remain sanctified, that means we are not laboring in vain. When people get persecuted, but in that persecution, their backbone of Christian conviction is very, very strong and they stand firm like the rock of Gibraltar. That means that those of us who are preaching and praying and laboring over them, we're not laboring in vain. But you know, if a temptation comes and you fall, 
any little sin and then you are backsliding any sin then we cannot see you again it means that we're laboring in vain because when the rapture happens then all our labor everything will just go down the drain i pray it will not be like that but you will stand firm like these believers in the bible like this stood firm look at colossians now i told you that paul the apostle prayed for all the people in colossians chapter one i'm reading from verse nine colossians chapter one reading from verse nine it says for this cause we also since the day we heard it do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. He prayed for these people. He said, we heard about your conversion. We heard about your coming to the Lord. And since that time, we've been praying for you that you'll be filled with knowledge, not ignorance. Ignorance brings backsliding. When you don't know the word of God, the mind of God, when you don't know the doctrine of the Bible, when you don't know the standard that God expects of his people, it brings backsliding. But when you are filled with knowledge, the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that she might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. The same thing, the same thing. That you will walk worthy unto all pleasing, pleasing the Lord every time. In little things, in big things, in minor things, in major things things, in spiritual things, in sacred things, in secular things, in the place of work, everywhere you are that this is the knowledge of his will. The word of God speaks to every area of our lives and therefore I'm asking what will God want me to do? What will Christ do in this situation? What's the knowledge of his will? Any little decision I'm taking, any major decision I'm taking, it is not how will the people see it? What will the people say? What will they say? Will they be happy with me? Will they not be happy with it. That's not important. But the knowledge of his will. What does he want? What should I do? In the morning, afternoon, and evening, Sunday or Monday, during weekdays or sunny days, whatever, what should I do? That you are filled with the knowledge of his will. And you are not, you know, a person that is always asking, will the people approve of this? Will they like this? Will they praise me for this? Will they support me for this? Will they kind of uh, say congratulations for this? Whether they blame you or they praise you, that doesn't matter. It is the will of God, the word of God that matters in our lives. And I pray that he'll give you that conviction in Jesus' name. It says that she might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. That's what the Lord expects and that's what we're going to do in Jesus' name. And there were people that did that in the past. They pleased the Lord. They did the pleasure of the Lord. Look at Isaiah chapter 44. Here is what God said about you know one man. He said, I'm raising this man up. And the reason I'm raising this man up is that he will fulfill my pleasure. And the reason why you are saved is so that you will fulfill his pleasure. The reason why you are born again, you are converted, you are brought into the church, into the family of God is so that you will do the pleasure of the Lord. And they say, why you are in the church? Some people don't know why they are in the church. They say, which church do you go? Then I go to such and such a church. Why are you there? Daddy said we should be going to the church. That is why I'm going there. What if daddy changes? And my brother said, that is the church we should be going now. What if he changes tomorrow? If you don't know why you are there, if the other people you are following, if they change, then you will change. I heard that she knows so and so. It was coming before. And because it's not coming anymore, I'm also concerned whether I should come or not. You don't know why you're in the church. You know why you're in the kingdom. If you know why you're in the kingdom, it will not matter what other people do. You will say, here I am, here I stand, and no storm will blow me out of this place. Nothing will draw me out, nothing will drive me out. Because she know you are here for a purpose, and that purpose will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 44 of Isaiah verse 28. Verse 28. Isaiah chapter 44. I'm reading verse 28 that says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all 
my pleasure. That's what God wants. It says, he'll perform all my pleasure. Have you thought about that in your life, that the reason why he called you into the kingdom is so that you will fulfill all his pleasure. And I pray that that thing will come in your life when you'll not bother yourself about the smiles of men or women. You'll not bother yourself about the frowns of men or women. You don't bother about anybody on earth. The only thing is that you'll fulfill all the pleasure of the Lord, all the will of the Lord. That's the only thing that will matter to you. That's real spiritual Christian strength. When you look at God only, you look at the word of the Lord only, I will say, whatever pleases him, that's all I want to know anything about. I don't want to know anything about what people say, what people think, how people feel. All I want is I will please the Lord. And great will be the power of the Lord in your life in Jesus' name. I come to point number two now, the unfailing power of faith in his promises, the unfailing power of faith. If we're going to live this life that is pleasing to the Lord, the life that we can stand and we can say, this is what I know. He has filled me with the knowledge of his will. I'm going to do that will. I told you before, in small things and big things, minor things and major things, in things sacred and things secular, I just want to do his will alone. We need faith and the power of faith to walk in our lives. And I pray that that faith, God, will develop it in you. And when you're looking at God, you know that God is greater than Satan. God is greater than demons. God is greater than men. God is greater than all people put together. And this is that God who has commanded you that this is how to live. I'll say, I will my life. I surrender my life. I give my life completely unto him so that I can fulfill his will. And it doesn't matter to me what people say, what people think. God and God alone. Christ and Christ alone will be the focus of my life. That's the real faith we're talking about and such a faith will do wonders in the Lord and you'll be among us. I'm looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're looking at uh, verse 11. We're looking at the second part of chapter 1, verse 11, but I'm going to read everything. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God will count you worthy of this calling to fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness. Look at this now. And to fulfill also the work of faith with power. To fulfill all the work of faith with power. The prayer of Paul the Apostle and his companions that prayed along with him requested that God will fulfill the work of faith in the lives of all the members of the church of the Thessalonians. Do you remember that he had mentioned about their faith before? Look at chapter 1 of 4 Thessalonians verse 3. 4 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. He had noticed that they had this faith before. That's the faith that brought them to conversion. The faith that brought them to salvation. The faith that brought them into this life of righteousness. It brought them into Christ. and became new creatures in Christ. If any man be in Christ, a new creature. All things are passed away. And behold, how many things? All things have become new. That was the faith that brought them into the kingdom. But then the faith did not just bring them to the camp, leave them there. It made them to be growing and growing and growing in faith. We're looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. The faith that grows, the faith that grows. And, and that should be the kind of faith you have. If your faith is not growing, it will be decreasing. Eventually when you subtract one and subtract one and subtract one, even if it was 100 before, if you keep on subtracting, keep on subtracting, Practice, keep on subtracting to become zero. But the, the faith that is growing and increasing all the time. Look at Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3. It says that we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me, because that your faith grows exceedingly. Your faith grows exceedingly. Every new challenge, the faith was growing. Every new conflict, the faith was growing. Every new battle, the faith was growing. Every new persecution, the faith was growing. Your faith grows exceedingly. It's not like people, any little problem, any little frown, any little uh, withdrawal of people, any little gossip uh, by people, any little abuse or insult by people. I cannot go to church anymore. I cannot read Bible anymore. I'm discouraged. I don't want to do anything anymore because, uh, you know, see, they're talking about me like, and it's only a lie. They're telling tell lies against me because of that they cannot stand 
if you are a real child of God, every lie of the devil makes you strong. You see, that's the devil. If I wasn't doing something great and something good, he'll have nothing to talk about. But because I'm destroying his kingdom, that's why he's trying to blackmail me. Your faith will be going stronger and stronger in the Lord. And this is how the Thessalonian believers, this is how they saw their Christian lives. Because they kept on growing, I will keep on growing. I said, I will keep on growing. You know, everything they throw at you will make you to bounce back. You have resilience, you have courage, and you have real stamina in your backbone. Because you're a real child of God, your faith grows exceedingly. And that's what we learned about uh, these people now in his prayer for them. He requested that God in his mighty unlimited power will fulfill or accomplish all possible work of faith. What did he mean by that? When he interceded for them, when he prayed for them and he was making supplication for these people that their faith will still keep on growing and keep on abounding and then fulfill all the will of the Lord. What he meant is this number one, that they will have the faith that works the work of God. God. The faith that works the work of God. When well, your faith is increasing, then it leads you in and in into the work of the Lord. Number two, the faith that walks in righteousness, walking in the light, in the truth, in all the revelation of God's will. The more you know the word of God, that's what I've got to do. That's what I've got to do. Other people who are not serious with God, they say, oh, that's not possible. How can somebody do that? Other people who are not prayerful, they say, that's not possible. How can somebody live like that? Other people People who are not submissive to God, they say, I cannot do that. That is too much. That's a great challenge. But you are walking in the light. And whatever light the Lord is showing you, whatever commandment the Lord is showing you, say, I can do that. I can do that. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthened me. And that strength will come in Jesus' name. Number three is the faith that stands firm and faithfully in the evil day. The faith that is able to stand. While the people are running up Elter Skelter, we have had information. We have news that uh, they are doing this that place. They are doing, you cannot go out now. You cannot do anything now. You cannot go to Bible study. You cannot go to service because they're over there and uh, somebody will do this. Somebody will do that. They cannot stand in the evil day. Uh, all days are not equal. Don't you see the names of the days? They're not the same. Monday, Tuesday, that's different. Wednesday, that's different. Thursday, that's different. Friday, that's different. Saturday, that's different. Sunday, that's different. Days are different. There are some days when it's sunny. There's, there are some days when it's rainy. There are some days when it's dreary. And because but if you're a real child of God you say in the evil day in the serious day, in the terrible day, in the difficult days, the perilous days, I'll be able to stand. That's why Paul the Apostle was praying for them because he knew that the days are not all the same. They'll be up, they'll be down, they'll be here, they'll be there. There will be kind of fear, there will be fright. Whatever it is, it says that you have the faith that will be walking with the Lord and standing firm even in the time of difficulty. Number four is the faith that receives and which withstands the enemy of the soul. The enemy of your soul may come against you and he will say, that heaven, I'm telling you, I don't want you to go there. He is going to hell and he wants you to go to hell with him. You say, no way, no way. I've signed my name for heaven and that heaven, I want to go there. I said I want to go there. And therefore, when the devil comes, when the enemy of your soul comes, and he says, no way. Oh, you say there's a way. I'm going to get through. I'm going through. I am going through. I said I'm going through. I'm going through. Anybody there? Are you going through? You'll go through in Jesus' name. Number five is a face that overcomes the world, overcomes the flesh, overcomes the devil. All those three enemies of your soul coming together, the flesh and the world and the devil, and yet the face that overcomes. Number six, there is a faith that keeps believers pure and clean in a corrupt and crooked world. That even though the company where you are working, they are making all their bribes and all their corruption, and then the place where you live, they are changing this and changing that, and there's no standard with anybody. You do not meddle with them that are given to change. You say, here is the old ancient landmark. Here is the here is that faith was delivered unto the saints until I that this is where I stand. And because of the faith you have, like the faith of Daniel, you'll be able to stand on corrupted, incorruptible in Jesus' name. Number seven, it is the faith that inherits the great and precious promises of the Lord by which we become the partakers of the divine nature. 
nature. Number eight, it is the faith that prays and receives undeniable answers to prayer. Number nine, it is the faith that goes forth in the name of the Lord to preach and to lead sinners to conversion in Christ. Number ten, the faith that does exploits for God's glory and the expansion of his kingdom. Eleven is the faith that lives and labors as Christ did. Number twelve, it is the faith that sees heaven from earth and endures till the very end. And Jesus Christ said that only those who endure to the end, the same shall be saved. I pray God will count you among the number. And that's the kind of faith he wants us to have. The faith that we receive the word of God. And when you are hearing the word of God, you're not thinking it's the word of man. That's the idea. That's the opinion. That's how they say it. That's how they talk. You say, that's the word of God. And I'm going to receive every jot and every tittle of that. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You put your faith in that word, and it works effectually, effectually, effectively in you. Galatians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Uh, this man had faith. And this is the kind of faith he wants to pass across to you. The faith that gives you inner strength, inner stability and stamina. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by the faith of the Son of God. He said, the very kind of faith that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had, that's the kind of faith I have. I'm living my life now by the faith of the Son of God. The faith that overcame Satan, the faith that overcame the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the faith that overcame all that Judas Christ were plotting and planning, the faith that overcame, that even walked on the sea. It says, that's the kind of faith I have. I'm living by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When you have that kind of faith, nothing will defeat you in life. Nothing will put your back to the wall. Nothing will so terrify you that you will run away from your inheritance. Eternal life is your inheritance. Sanctification, holiness is your inheritance. The church of the living God, this is your inheritance. Eternal blessings, that is your inheritance. And nobody will scare you. Nobody will frighten you. And then you run away from the inheritance the Lord has given you because you are living by the faith of the Son of God who loved you and he gave himself for you. In God Galatians chapter 5 verse 6, the faith that walks by love. Galatians chapter 5 verse 6, it says, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision neither availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which walketh by love. Your faith is not idle. Your faith is not a kind of passive. Your faith is active. It walketh by love. The word of God, the love of God directing you, motivating you, and making you to be the kind of person, the kind of man, the kind of of woman, the kind of boy or girl that you ought to be. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 16. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 16. It says, above all, taking the shield of faith. Here it is. All that the devil will throw at you. There's nothing the devil will try to do. And try to throw at you that you cannot overcome. You will overcome. It says, taking the shield of faith, where we teach shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Can you make it? Can you quench all the fire that's of the wicked? By faith. The faith of the Son of God that implants within us. That's the faith that gives us determination. We are decided that I'm forsaking the world. I'm following after the Lord. I'm going to follow him to the end. And nothing will change that conviction in Jesus' name. And we're looking at Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. There are promises to inherit. And there are inheritances to have in the kingdom of God. And it is a faith that you have. This faith that has the unfailing power in the promises of God. That's what Paul the apostle was praying for. For you, for me, for the church of the Thessalonians. In Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12. It says that ye be not slothful. 
but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Inherit the promises. We are looking at the promises one by one. Salvation promises there. Holiness uh, promises there. Salvation promises there. Healing promises there. Deliverance promises there. Provision promises there. All promises concerning all things that the Lord has given us. And then you say by patience and faith and patience and faith and patience and faith, I'm going to inherit all the promises of God. There will be no lack in your life. There will be no limitation in your life because the faith is driving you on in terrible times, in dark days to say, I come out of this because the light of God will shine at the end of the tunnel for the man, for the woman that has the faith. I pray I'm talking about you. I said I'm talking about you. In First John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. First John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. And for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Are you born of God? I said, are you born of God? Then you'll overcome the world. The people of the world, the calls of the world, and the pressures of the world will not overcome you if you are really born of God. That's how we know those who are born again. Those who are born again, uh, we're not shielded and protected and hiding inside the church. We go back to our communities. We go back to areas where we're living. And in those areas where we're living, uh, the agents of Satan are still there. Occultism is still there. And all those unbelievers are still there. And some of them backsliders are there too. I was there before. I was a part of that church before. But you know something happened. I thought uh, you know, I, I used to pray. I used to do but now you see, uh, you know my uh, water was uh, too much and then the water went under the bridge and uh, you know, just was blown away with the water. I said, that's you. That's you. But me I'm going to lay by this faith I'm going to endure to the end in Jesus name. And that's why it says over here that the people who are really born of God, they overcome the world. And I'm one of those people that overcame. I said I'm one of those people that overcome. And I'll keep on overcoming in Jesus' name. Are you going to overcome? I said, are you going to overcome? Or when all those tempters and temptations, temptresses, tempters, whoever they are, when they come, then you're crying and crying, hey, pastor, pastor, where are you? Well, where, where, yeah, where is your own faith? I said, where is your faith? Why don't you bring out that sword of the spirit and tell that devil and tell that tempter, it is written they will flee away. And they will not bother you anymore in Jesus' name. But you know, every little problem, you are crying for prayer warrior. Every little problem, where is the pastor? Where is so and so? But if you have the faith and you are born again, I will say, I'm going to stand. And by the grace of God, they will stand. Because whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our faith, who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. That's why we know that we're going to endure to the end. Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 35, cast not away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Just a little while, just a little while, a little while of suffering, a little while while of persecution, a little while of, of temptation, a little while of difficulty, a little while of enduring and then he that will come, he will come, he will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith but if any man draw back my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Does God have pleasure in those who backslide? Those who go away from the Lord? Those who go away from the word of God? No, the just shall live by faith but if any man draw back if any woman draw back, if any child draws back, because of the overpowering examples of other people, uh -uh, if so and so cannot stand, how can I stand? I will stand. I came to the Lord before I knew them. If so and so cannot stand, how can I stand? You can stand. Because knowing the Lord is a personal decision, holding on to the horns of the altar and saying, Oh Lord, I will not let you go except to bless me. I'm going to stand. It's a personal decision. You came into this world all alone by yourself. You came into the Christian faith all alone by yourself. And when you are going to die, Jesus tarries, you die all alone by yourself. And when the rapture is going to happen, you get them one by one by one, not in a company, all alone by yourself. If you're going to stand, it's a personal decision, a personal determination. 
Testament. That's why it says, the just shall live by faith. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him, but we are not of them who draw back. Are you part of those who draw back? They draw back unto perdition, but we are of them that believe unto the saving of the soul. Will endure to the end in Jesus' name. I come to point number three now, and it's the unforgettable praise and faithfulness of his people. We're looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're looking at verse 12. It says that the name of Jesus, of our Lord Jesus, may be glorified in you and in are ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see what he wants us to do? He says that so that your life will bring glory to the Lord. Your life will bring glory unto the Lord that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him. The reason for our creation that's the praise of God. The purpose of our redemption, that's the praise of the Lord. And the goal of our existence here on earth is because we need to bring glory to God. The reason for our citizenship in God's kingdom is to glorify the name of God and to glorify the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You must be asking yourself every day, where I am now, am I glorifying God? Where I'm sitting down now, am I glorifying God? In the company of these people that are making jest of the Bible, making jest of the doctrines of the Bible, making jest of you know, of the deep things of God. Am I glorifying God here in the midst of the drunkards and the blasphemers? Am I glorifying God here in the midst of the people that are living for the flesh? And all they want to do is to just live for the flesh. Am I glorifying God here? You must be asking yourself where you're sitting, where you're standing, where you're living, where you're going, where you're walking, anywhere you are. Am I glorifying God here in the friendships that I have, relationships that are my, my interaction with this man, my friendship with this man. Can I glorify God to the fullest extent if I keep on interacting with this man, if I keep on interacting with this woman, can I keep on glorifying the Lord? Every time he comes, he comes with a gossip. Every time he comes, he comes with backbiting. Every time he comes, he says something terrible about other people. Can I keep on glorifying God in relationship with this man or this woman? You must be asking yourself, anywhere you are, anything you are doing, any company you are keeping, does it bring glory to God? Is it to the praise and to the honor, to the glory of the Lord? That's how a Christian measures his life. That's how a Christian will kind of look at his life. And sometimes it's somebody who has left, you know, the kingdom of God. He, has, he says, you have not left the kingdom. Don't mind what they say. They leave the kingdom of God. They leave the church of the living God. And then they'll be roaming about, coming to knocking at your door. And in the things they say, while they put down the church, while they cheer the Bible, while they say, after all, they preach it like this, they preach it like this. But do you think you should believe that? Is that glorifying to God? When somebody is before you and somebody is talking to you and you see that huh, this way we are going, this thing we are talking, this thing we are discussing, this will not bring glory to God. It will be at that time you will leave. I don't to excuse me, I cannot continue in this. I want to glorify the name of the Lord. What we are saying now, what we are doing now will not bring glory to God and therefore I don't want to partake in this. Look at Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14, I'm looking at verse 7. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 7, it says, Go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. When somebody comes to you, it doesn't come with the knowledge of righteousness, the knowledge of the word of God, the knowledge of the will of God. He comes with error. He comes with discouragement. He comes and after he comes, you cannot pray right. After he has come, you cannot follow the right way. He's talking about a coordinator, talking about a group pastor, talking about this and talking about that. By the time he finishes, you say, what edification has this brought to me now? And what encouragement has it brought to me now? You should have stopped him. You should have let that please because it says in Proverbs 14 verse 7 go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge our lives will bring glory to God I said our lives will bring glory to God. Isaiah chapter 43, I'm reading from verse 7. Isaiah chapter 43, we're looking at verse 7. The Lord is telling us why you were born, why you came into this world, and why you were born again, and why your life is preserved in the kingdom. Isaiah 43, I'm looking at verse 7. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. You see that? That's why you were created. And then it says, I have formed him, yea, 
say, I have made him. Look at verse 21. It says, These people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. It says, The reason why you are born again, the reason why you come into the kingdom is so that you will show forth the praise of the Lord. Always think about them. The place where you are walking. Let's say, for example, somebody says, I'm a Christian. Uh huh. It's a Christian. It's selling alcohol, destroying other people's lives. Is that bringing glory to God? No. Other people, I'm a Christian, they're selling cigarettes and they destroy other people's lives. And then they say, I'm a child of, child of God. That's not being a child of God. Or they say they're children of God. They're sewing clothes and they're sewing bad clothes and terrible clothes, defiling clothes for other people. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. It's not by word of mouth. It's by what you do, the work you're doing, how it's lifting up other people, helping people to obey the word of God, helping people to be holy, helping people to be righteous. That's how to glorify God. But if a person is doing a kind of work that is destroying other people, people, make other people backslide, that's not glorifying God. And it says anything you do, wherever we are, we must bring glory unto the Lord. First Corinthians chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 31. First Corinthians chapter 10, we're looking at you from verse 31. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, what does it say? Do all to the glory of God, anything you do, anywhere you are. Any friendship you are keeping, any relationship you are keeping, it says you do all to the glory of God. Give no none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own pleasure, my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Everything you are doing so that they may be saved so that their lives will bring glory unto the Lord. That's what the Lord said in Matthew chapter 5 in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And there you let your light so shine before men so that when they see your good works, they glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matthew chapter 5 verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. And it says, but if the salt have lost its savor, when we shall it be salted, it is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out, but and to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they also may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I pray God will help us to do that. I say God will help us to do that. We are the citizens of the kingdom of God. And because we are the citizens of the kingdom of God, the reason why we are born again, the reason why we live in the kingdom is so that we'll be able to do his will, obey his commandments, and then follow all his statutes. And that uh, uh, Israel failed, and because Israel failed uh, to do what the Lord has called them to do, that's why God said, it's only begotten son that, that he will save us from our sin and raise up a righteous people that will love him, that will serve him, that will honor him, that will glorify him and the church is to do his will the church is to be his word the church is to submit to his sovereignty and to glorify his name and to live only for the glory of his name and to worship his majesty protect and preserve his honor and selflessly bring others to give him honor and glory as well so that everybody will know that he is king of kings and lord of lords you see where i read to you where it says let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven what he's telling us is let your light so shine let your lives be so righteous let your character be so godly let your love be so christ-like and let your service be so beneficial let your heart be so pure and let your conscience be so clear and clean let your motive and intention be so transparent and let your conversation be so genuine that men and angels will glorify god on your behalf and they will praise the name of the lord jesus christ because of his transforming power that has worked in your life i want you to go home with with this in first peter chapter 2 reading from verse 9 the reason why we're in the kingdom this is why he has called us the reason why he has placed us in the kingdom at such a time like this it says in first peter chapter 2 verse 9 but she are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation a peculiar people are we ordinary people i said are we ordinary people 
peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Has he called you into the light? Then walk in the light. Be a peculiar person and be a person that is zealous of good works, that he has saved you, he has redeemed you, he has cleansed you with the blood of the Lamb and the life he now wants you to live is not to glorify the world, it's not to show off all those things in the world, it's not to show whatever it is, but it's to bring glory and honor and majesty unto God so that people, when they will see your life, they say, Lord, the way you have transformed this person, transform me like that, and the way you have saved this person, save me like that, and the way you make this person to be shining, reflecting the glory of God. Do that for me so that you'll become an object of prayer to make a change, a transformation in the lives of other people. I believe it can happen. I said it can happen. Why don't you rise up and pray and say, Lord, make it happen. Make it happen. Make it happen that my life will bring honor. My life will bring glory unto you. You talk to the Lord in prayer today. You see the prayer of Paul the Apostle concerning these believers. A prayer that was spirit-inspired spirit guided and spirit controlled and spirit directed you pray that your life also will be like this are you born again are you a child of god do you really know the lord as your personal savior i will say yes lord i thank you i thank you because i came into the kingdom i thank you because i'm born again i thank you because all my sins are washed away talk to the lord in prayer talk to the lord in prayer that your life your life your life will show that you're a real real child of god and remember the purpose remember the purpose the the unfolding purpose of his pleasure. He wants you to fulfill his pleasure. He wants you to glorify him. He wants you to be a real, real child of God. No skeleton in your cupboard. There's nothing dirty, nothing defiling, nothing sinful, nothing evil. Talk to the Lord. Lord, make me like this. What's the pleasure of the Lord? That you live a holy life, live a righteous life, live a pure life. That's the pleasure of the Lord. That's the reason you are born again. That your life will bring joy to the heart of the Father. And His will that He reveals. You will not reject His will. You submit and surrender to his will. No guilty conscience. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Show the Lord your desire. I want to fulfill all your will. Not my will. Not my will. Not my will. I want to fulfill all your will. Not the will of the world. The world is like a pressure cooker. Wanting to force you into their mold. To force you into what they want. Want to withdraw your love, your affection, your concentration, your focus. From the Lord. They want to replace God in your life. Always thinking about the world, pleasing the world, dressing to attract the world, spending money to attract the world, attending functions to please the world. They want to replace God in your life. That's why they frown, they persecute, they abuse, they make fun. They want to be your Lord. They want you to surrender your will unto them. But you say, no. I will fulfill all the good pleasure of the Lord. And you need faith. Real faith, genuine faith, unwavering faith. That Lord, I believe you. You can make me righteous. You can make me holy. 
You can make me focus on you, concentrate on you. you can help me to hold the things of the world with a loose hand. So that no friend is so strong that he'll pull me away from you. No man, no woman here on earth will steal my heart from you. Faith in God. Faith in the promises. Faith to stand. Faith to walk. Faith to resist. To resist the devil. Faith to say no to anyone campaigning for the devil. Campaigning for the world. Faith to say no to anyone campaigning for the flesh. A faith to stand. That's the faith that overcomes the world. The faith that overcomes the flesh. The faith that overcomes the indulgences of the world. The flesh would like you to pet, to pamper, to be soft, to be weak, not to be strong, but to say no to the flesh. If you are born again, you have that faith. You have that faith. You have that faith. That you say, I will not backslide. I will not go back. I will not forsake the Lord. I've laid my hands on the plow. I will not turn back. There's a faith that holds on until the very end. And a faith that keeps on preaching, winning souls, counting important, essential, what, count, what God counts important and essential. Dropping everything the Lord says is not of eternal value, throwing them away like toys. As a child of God, you outgrow the toys. The things of the world, their toys, throw them away. Hold on to things eternal. Now you pray that from today for the rest of your life, all you want to do is bring glory to God. All you want to do is to live to the praise of the name of the Lord. Let your light so shine. You'll not walk in darkness anymore. Let your light so shine. You'll not walk in the darkness of immorality, the darkness of occultism, the darkness of idol worship. Let your light so shine. Let your light be so righteous. That the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all iniquity, from all sin, from all unrighteousness. Righteous life. Righteous life. Righteous life. And let your character be so godly. Your behavior, your character. Receive more of the grace of God. The Thessalonian believers had faith. Their faith grew. They had, they had love, their love grew. They had courage, their courage increased. Let the godliness in you increase. Let the grace in you increase. Let the conviction in you become so firm. Nothing will turn you back from the way to heaven. And let your love be so Christ-like. Loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Loving the church, the believers, as Christ has loved the church. And loving your neighbors like yourself. 
And let your service in the kingdom of God be so beneficial. Your service in the kingdom be so beneficial. Let your heart be so pure. Your conscience be so clean and so clear. Your motive, your intention. Let it be so transparent. No self-centeredness. No evil. No hidden agenda. Let the words of your mouth be filled with grace. No gossiping, backbiting, evil speaking, lying, hypocrisy, deception, hatred, bitterness. Live every day in readiness for the rapture. Be a real child of God. A peculiar person showing for shining forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light.